Yep, I got, uh, I've got nothing. No joke, I actually sat and stared at the terrifying starkness of a blank page for hours trying to come up with a video idea. But I couldn't. And what sucks is that I knew, I just knew that beneath the blankness lay the swirling cornucopia of creative ideas just waiting to gush out on the page and fill it. But they never came. All that was there was the periodic flicker of the cursor, taunting me, offering me a transient slit into the world beyond the barren white. And that world was beautiful. But I couldn't have it. No matter with how much pressure I pressed, no matter how hard I tried to break that sliver wide open, how strongly I tried to will the words into existence, all I got was that soft, familiar pounding between my temples that comes from having your cognitive pipes clogged, pulsing, perhaps not coincidentally, in disheartening harmony with the cursor at the top of the page. You've probably been in a similar position that I have. Maybe you're trying to write a paper, or draw something, come up with a creative idea for a business or a YouTube video or something. You're sitting there racking your brain for some form of inspiration, but you come up with nothing, no matter how hard you try. Many people discuss the science of creativity and how to be more creative, but fewer people talk about when we want to be, but can't. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look into the psychology and neuroscience of creative blockages, and in doing so, hopefully come up with a few ways to be able to break out of them. One may be inclined to think that a block is just the opposite of being productive. However, as Alice Flatery writes in The Midnight Disease, The Drive to Write Writer's Block in the Creative Brain, that sort of equivalence doesn't really pan out. Flaherty emphasizes that blockages are not merely the absence of productivity, but in part defined by the anguish derived from that lack of productivity. As she says, someone who is writing but not suffering does not have writer's block, he or she is merely not writing. Indeed, many people who suffer from creative blocks are able to continue being productive at tasks that are unrelated to their primary pursuits. It's similar to how many people can finally muster the energy to clean their apartments when presented with an assignment that they don't actually want to do. So it's not merely a lack of creativity, it's when you can't be creative at one specific thing and then suffer because of it. And said suffering may actually be part of what's driving the lack. Researchers know that there are lots of things driving creativity defocused attention, mental flexibility, and cognitive control, just to name a few. But psychological and physiological stress, you know the thing that you're probably feeling as you bang your head against the desk trying to come up with words, has been shown to be negatively associated with all of these constructs. So part of what makes creative blocks so intractable is that they're reinforcing. We don't feel creative, so we feel stress, and stress depletes the creativity, and we get even more stressed about that, and on and on it goes. But sometimes these issues are not directly self-inflicted. Emotional fatigue and burnout are other negative correlates of mental flexibility. Feeling emotionally drained because of your work, your living situation, or your relationships with others can erode away at your creativity. Indeed, this has been implicated in professions as wide-ranging as school teachers to airline stewards and stewardesses. And there are other times when the creative blocks are completely beyond our control. Some researchers note cases where creative blocks could be caused by micro seizures and lesions on the parts of the brain responsible for making the connections necessary for that act in question. There's also research showing strong links both associatively and neurologically between various mental illnesses such as depression and creative blockages. So what the research tells us is that mental blocks are both partially a neurological issue as well as a psychological one. That is, part of it could be answered by impediments to the working of the brain's wiring, while part of it could only be understood by the motivations of the owner of that mind. In any event, Frank Herbert was definitely onto something when he wrote that fear is the mind killer. Any other Doom fans in, in the house? Uh, my wife is actually at work as, as I'm filming this, so I, I guess technically not. Anyways, now that we have a sense of why we get blocks, is there something we can do to prevent them? If you've managed to come out of a creative block and you want to prevent yourself from falling into another one, a lot of research on creativity suggests that it is the result of dual processes working in concert. The first is your cognitive flexibility and your ability to integrate new ideas, but the second is a function of the time and effort that you put into it. It's possible to practice the act of being creative so that you can call on it again in the future. Increases in creative self-efficacy have been shown to increase creative output, but not if there's too much pressure to produce. Just like with physical exercise, you're going to have good days and bad days. So practice and, in doing so, don't get so stressed that you inadvertently restart that pernicious cycle. But if you're still in a block now, there are things that you can do to try to get out of it. First off, if you suspect that the blockage comes from some form of mental illness, your best bet would be to talk to your doctor. There are many therapies based on behavior and drugs alike that might be able to help you arrive at a place of normalcy. It's also important if you feel like your blockages come from emotional fatigue as well. I'm not going to sit here and get all self-helpy and preachy and tell you to change your paradigm from one of angst to 
lot of sunshine and unicorn sh because I really have no idea why you're feeling that angst. I know for me the large source of it is for finances, and despite what some people may insist, you can't just will money into existence. So I'm not going to stand here and just tell you to change how you're thinking. But you can talk to a professional about why you feel fatigued and burnt out. And if you can, I highly recommend that you do. There's no shame in seeking help. If however you feel like it's not because of one of those more chronic issues, there are practical ways you might be able to loosen the blockage. First, get regular sleep. Research shows that those who get the recommended amounts of sleep have less stress hormones built up and feel less stressed in general. Flaherty also speaks to the importance of getting good sleep and understanding if you're a morning person or a night person, as working at the correct times has also been shown to improve cognitive flexibility and performance in a whole host of domains. Second, if this is more the kind of I have an assignment due by the time I wake up kind of thing, you might benefit from getting up from the computer and not trying to think about the thing that you were directly thinking about. You know, take a break. Research shows that allowing yourself to disassociate from the problem at hand may diminish stress levels and allow you to stumble upon the linkages that were impeded by your internal cognitive governor. Just like when you focus on one thing at the expense of everything else in frame, taking a step back allows you to get a better sense of the whole picture. Finally, if you're like me and find that the blockage comes from a perfectionist streak, remind yourself that it's okay to hold yourself to a high standard, but also remember that above all else, the perfect is the enemy of the good. I hope that you guys found this video helpful. It was legitimately inspired by the pains of writer's block. Sometimes inspiration can come from paradoxical places. Looking forward to seeing your guys' thoughts on the science of creative blockages, any thoughts that cropped up while watching this video, or suggestions for future topic. I'm more than happy to receive those down in the comment section below. Look forward to reading them and answering a few of them in next week's office hours. Before we get into comment responses, I just want to give a quick shout out to Knowing Better. He recently had a video on the Southern Democratic slash Republican you know, party switch, and he asked me to talk for a couple of minutes about the topic. Also, hello to all the people who came over from the channel from that collaboration. Hi! It was a lot of fun. I appreciate the opportunity opportunity, and I'm glad that y'all are here. Alright, so last time we talked about how the impeachment process works, so let's hop into your guys' thoughts on the topic. Theron Stormwind commented on the fact that impeachment's political nature could make it so that bad presidents could stay in if their party happens to be controlling Congress, which is an excellent observation. It really speaks to how optimistic the founders were at the notion that political parties wouldn't form and or if they did, they wouldn't coordinate across branches. And that optimism was probably evaporating really quickly as the antecedents of the American Two Party structure just started forming like three Congresses after the ratification of the US Constitution. So. That might have been something they wanted to revisit once that happened, but unfortunately they did not. Dorian Sapiens asked that if a president were to have committed illegal acts, if Congress could then take those as grounds for impeaching the judges that said president appointed, you know, purely hypothetically. My response to this is pretty similar to Helios Infinitus's, which points to the fact that the president doesn't unilaterally appoint the judges, but that they are confirmed by Congress. If Congress knows that the president is implicated in some shady stuff, the onus is on them to increase their scrutiny of the judges that he recommends. If they don't, then my personal preference is to replace the representatives for abdicating one of their core constitutional prerogatives. I'm not sure you could make the argument that the judges themselves should be impeached because the Constitution specifies that impeachment should happen if they are to be guilty of, you know, treason or high crimes or misdemeanors. That said, if the judges were to know that the president was shady before Congress did and accepted his nomination because of that or despite that, I think that a case could be made for impeaching them on something akin to conspiracy. But wholesale, I, I don't I don't think so. This is one of the many reasons why I harp about voting so much. Don't just vote for president, vote for Congress and the Senate. They can't often do much without the other party's involvement at this point. If you want liberal judges, or conservative judges for that matter, voting only in the presidential election is going to open the door for outcomes that probably don't match your preferences. That's all the time that we have for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. I truly enjoy reading all your guys' comments and responding to them in this format. It's just, it's, it's a blast and a half, and I sincerely appreciate it. Thanks for everything that we talked about. As always, be down in the doobie doo as well as links to the Facebook, Twitter, and the blog. Look forward to seeing you guys out there as well. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you consider giving it a thumbs up. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by commenting down below, by sharing this video, and by subscribing to the channel to stay in the loop for more awesome social science content is uploaded. If you want to be guaranteed to be in the loop when I upload a new video, be sure to click the bell icon as well. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.